Hey guys, Dr. Greg here. Uh, here's your first lecture for the semester. Excited? Um, a lot of these are going to be up on video, as I've discussed with you already. And uh, we're going to start off. We're talking about biology. So, simple question. Biology is the study of life. What's life? What do we consider alive? Um, different textbooks, different teachers will probably give you different types of lists as to what exactly is considered alive and what's not. We're going to choose five characteristics here from your uh, Pearson textbook. Um, five characteristics. The first one, all organisms are made up of membrane-bound cells. Now, cells is a word that you guys have heard. You've probably used it a lot. You know that as living organisms, we're made up of trillions of cells. But what exactly is a cell? What is it made of? We're going to go into a little bit of detail on that today. Um, energy. All organisms acquire and use energy. I guess we think of this mostly as eating, but why do we eat? We need to get the energy out of a molecule, and energy, of course, is defined as the ability to do work. So we use that energy from our food to move, to think, to do all the cool stuff that human beings do and most living things do. Other characteristics of life, all organisms process hereditary information encoded by genes. Again, this probably sounds familiar to you. What we're going to do today, uh, probably next lecture more, or the next video, I should say, is clear up a few different terminologies. What's the difference between DNA and a gene? and a chromosome. Um, replication, all organisms are capable of reproduction, right? Otherwise, life would stop. Life would cease to exist. So all living things reproduce. They make babies. That's a cute way of saying it, I guess. Evolution, um, populations of organisms are continually evolving, okay? That's a big topic, of course, in biology. And again, by the next video, we'll try and maybe clear up a few misconceptions, give some more specific definitions as to what this all means for the remainder of the course. So if we were to start here, levels of biological organization, well, what do we see here? We see kind of these different tiers of, I would say, organization. All right, you guys have taken your basic chemistry class already, so you know that this here is an atom. It's a cartoon of an atom. And an atom is the smallest unit of matter, right? Smallest unit of matter, sort of. Smallest unit of matter to retain certain characteristics. Many atoms come together to give you a molecule. So, for example, H2O is a molecule you guys are all familiar with. It's one molecule of oxygen attached to two molecules of hydrogen. I messed that up. Two atoms of hydrogen attached to one atom of oxygen give you a molecule of water. Now, these molecules all come together and they give you a cell. And we're going to look at how the cell is organized. That's going to be a big topic for the beginning of this course. Um, again, defining what a cell is, trying to clear up some misconceptions, give you a specific idea of exactly what a cell is supposed to be. But you guys have probably heard that life on Earth is carbon-based, organic. I'm not talking about organic, like when you go to the groceries to get organic food. Organic means it has carbon atoms. That's the main part of the molecules that make up living organisms. Tissues are many cells cooperating to do a particular job. Okay, so in a human body you have muscle tissue, you have nervous tissue which transmits electrical signals. All right, so these are different tissues and different tissues can come together to make an organ. So think of an organ. How many of you guys thought of the heart? That's an organ, of course. Heart has muscle tissue. A heart has nervous tissue to tell it when to beat. So it's the nervous tissue sends electrical signals to the muscles to tell them when to beat and to cause them to beat at a particular rhythm. All right. And you can have organ systems, of course. The heart is part of an organ system um, that includes veins and arteries, and that entire organ system functions to circulate blood throughout your body. And many organ systems make an organism, a living thing. Um, are there unicellular organisms? Sure, there are tons. They're some of the most successful organisms on Earth. Um, we are multicellular organisms, many cells cooperating, organizing themselves in a way to interact with their environment. So this idea of a cell, let's focus on that a little bit. A membrane-bound cell. This is important. Membrane-bound. So cell membranes, if you were to think of the cell as a balloon, all right, and the stuff inside of the cell is the internal environment of the cell and the actual rubber part, the balloon, is the cell membrane. Well, that cell membrane is made of a molecule called phospholipid. So many molecules of phospholipid make up a cell membrane. 
Now, phospholipids do not dissolve in water. How come? Well, they are amphipathic. This word amphipathic means they have a polar head. So this top part of the molecule, that's the polar head of the molecule. It's hydrophilic. It interacts with water. But it has a hydrophobic, nonpolar set of tails. Two fatty acids. Okay, these are long carbon chains. These are hydrophobic. They're going to hide from water. So we say that a phospholipid, this entire molecule, is amphipathic. It has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic components. Now, water molecules, as we said, are going to interact with this part, but not with this part, and this creates some interesting effects. Okay? Phospholipids don't dissolve in water, but they will spontaneously form structures that we call micelles. Okay? This is when all the hydrophobic tails kind of um, hide themselves in this arrangement that we see up here, kind of a circle, looks kind of like a sunburst there. Or it can make a phospholipid bilayer. This is when all the hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails kind of line up. It almost looks like a sandwich there. Okay, so um, the phospholipid bilayer is one of the most important structures in biology. Why? Because a phospholipid bilayer makes what's called liposomes. So you see here, imagine this. This is the electron micrograph of different phospholipids. And essentially what we're seeing here well, this is a cartoon of that. It's the spherical arrangement of the phospholipid bilayer. And this is the basis of what a cell is. Now, a liposome is an empty phospholipid bilayer. But if we were going to add some stuff to this phospholipid bilayer, well, what do you have here? Proteins are another kind of molecule. Okay, You say proteins are a polymer. Polymer meaning many repeating molecules forming a long chain. So this is a polymer of amino acids. A polymer of amino acids make up proteins. And proteins are so diverse, they, can have, they, they, they are responsible for all the work and all the functions of your body. Okay, so proteins can also be amphipathic. Therefore, they can insert themselves in the phospholipid bilayer of a cell. You can see that here. All right. Well, obviously, this is very important because a cell needs to interact with its environment, right? It needs to be able to take materials from the external environment, essentially eat certain things from the environment. Maybe it needs to get rid of certain molecules. In multicellular organisms, of course, the cells need to be able to communicate with each other. So proteins can serve as kind of a doorway from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. All right. This term here, the fluid mosaic model, it refers to the phospholipid bilayer with proteins inside of it. And the proteins are kind of free to move throughout this phospholipid bilayer. So that's the fluid part. They can move. And the phospholipids and the proteins are moving in this balloon kind of structure. All right. And again, one function of the proteins can be a door to allow certain molecules to go in and out of the cell. Proteins are also important enzymes, meaning they accelerate particular chemical reactions that would be happening in the cell. All right? Not all proteins are membrane bound. You may have some proteins that are actually inside of the cell, obviously carrying out certain chemical reactions. Chemical reactions in an organism are called organism's metabolism, a set of all chemical reactions happening within an organism. So what is a cell? Cell is the smallest unit of life. It's a self-replicating, membrane-bound structure. So when I say membrane-bound, what am I referring to here? I'm referring to the liposome. That's the membrane. It's a self-replicating, membrane-bound structure that can maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is a fancy word that means the internal environment of an organism is going to be different from the external environment of the organism. And of course, proteins are responsible for maintaining that homeostasis. So a liposome is basically an empty cell. So what's the difference between a liposome and a cell? Well, the cell has stuff in it. It's going to have DNA in it. It's going to have different proteins carrying out different chemical reactions inside of it. So here's an electron micrograph of a cell. We can see the nucleus. We can see little membrane-bound compartments inside of the cell, which we call organelles. There are two kinds of cells, eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Okay, there's an important difference. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. They have membrane-bound organelles. Organelles are like mini-organs inside of a cell. They each have their own function inside of a cell.
And when you think of eukaryotic cells, you're thinking of animals, plants, and fungus. So we're eukaryotes, we're eukaryotic organisms. What's a prokaryote? A prokaryote doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have membrane-bound organelles. Um, and when you're thinking of prokaryotes, you're thinking of bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, things like that. So, um, all living organisms need to acquire and use energy. This has already kind of been talked about already. We talked about homeostasis. Well, what do we use energy for? What do we eat for? Okay, we use energy um, by consuming something else. We get energy from the environment by consuming something else. We use this to do work, and most of that work is really just to maintain homeostasis. And again, homeostasis is an organism's tendency to keep a constant internal environment. Your internal body temperature needs to be kept constant. Uh, the concentration of certain molecules in your body, like glucose or salt, need to be kept constant. Okay, not too high, not too low. So human beings keep a constant internal temperature of 37 degrees. Your blood glucose, when you're fasted, not, uh, not, uh, you haven't eaten for a while, will be at about 79.2 or 110 milligrams per deciliter. Um, disruptions of homeostasis usually means you're sick. If your blood sugar is too high or too low or you have too high salt, something like that, this will cause damage to your body. Homeostasis has been disrupted. Okay, so um, those are the first two. We've kind of talked about these other things a little bit, but we've talked about what a cell is and how cells... Um, acquire and use energy, just briefly. Um, all topics that we're going to talk about later on in the course, we're going to come back to all of this. Um, and that would be it for now. Maybe you want to take a little break before continuing on to part two of what is life.